What's going on? Boys, arm yourselves, life stuff. No specific unifying theme this time. We are just going to hit topics and to see where we end up. Now, under normal circumstances, this would be an order development video. We reserve those for, well, order development and random topics. Last time we said we got triple our views in a quarter of the time. And I want to know what happened, so we're going to experiment. Now, for some analytics background stuff, typically when videos get far more views than they normally do, either you got an algorithm bump or someone shared your video somewhere people are going to see. But if it's an algorithm bump, your impressions percentage, or at least mine, is going to be somewhere between 12 and 15 percent. That's how you know the algorithm, to some extent, has picked up your video. Mine. Normal numbers are between 5 and 8 percent. And if someone shares your video somewhere, if that's where the numbers are coming from, YouTube will tell you. It won't link to the specific post, but you get an idea of what's going on. This video was linked on this website, and this number of people have clicked it. And you can kind of figure out who posted what where, but it takes a lot of additional work. And in addition to both of those views bumps sources, our average length of viewing is around 9 minutes. And when we get one of these views bumps someone shares or the algorithm bumps your video, our average view length time stays around 9 minutes. Sometimes it'll slip down to 7, but it doesn't get any lower than that. And another thing to note is you don't get all these analytics at once. This all to say, like casting bones, once you've done it a while, you can kind of work out what's going on on a video or with your channel, even if YouTube won't spell it out for you. So with for coping, we got a substantial bump. However, our impressions percentage was 5. For this number of views in this amount of time, that is irregular. And then, with all those numbers, the average view duration dropped down to 3 minutes. And again, when you get bumps like these, even if they are substantial, triple what you normally get, if it's organic, some of these numbers will stay the same. View duration is one of them. Here, view duration dropped down to 3 minutes. So, low impressions, tanked view duration, this is probably an inorganic bump, I'm thinking. Especially with how negative this influx was. And I'm used to people disliking the channel. But, again, typically, people who dislike this channel are sporadic. It's like a birds of a feather flock together situation, except with people who hate you. You do dumb weirdo shit, you attract dumb weirdos, you attract some dumb weirdos who hate you, and they attract you in dumb weirdo ways. It is severely and uniquely mentally ill. They tend not to organize, these days anyway. So in terms of organization and consistent vernacular in some cases, but vibe, they have influxed from one place. So I'm waiting on my link analytics so I can figure out where generally these people are coming from. And then those analytics arrive and there's nothing that sticks out. Everything on the link front is normal. And to me, that is odder than someone stumbling upon a video that says from a channel they aren't familiar with and then use it to rage bait people who are also 
unfamiliar with the channel but don't like the word to advantage themselves in some way. That would at least make sense. This is odd. You write the word and then even though you aren't talking about what people who would hate you would think you are talking about, a small backlash materializes out of the ether. So what's happening? Where did these people come from if they apparently didn't come from anywhere? And if they didn't come from anywhere, why are they uniform in essence? I have two theories. One, close encounters with dead internet political bots. Or two, there is a political algorithm that YouTubers are not made aware of. And maybe people aren't made aware of. Built with the express purpose of deepening divides between people. Because the nationalism we were talking about in the last video was not the that response seemed to be targeted at. Odd is the word. Now, what else has been going on? I got stuck with a hell assignment, which is why I have a few days off now, and I've been thinking about hope. We'll start with hope, and I wrote a note. You need to believe an answer can be found, but you can under no circumstances look seriously for that answer or any other. We have established nothing is good. Everything is awful, and the more you follow those trails to their ends, the more you prove to yourself that nothing is good, nothing is righteous, there's, there's no reason to hope, because it's all a trick to get you closer or more vulnerable to the evil that is there. Ironically, the less protected you are. The more you learn the ways everything is fake and built to kill you, the more all you can look at anything as is it's fake and here to kill you. And that is what everything is, but if you stay in that state for too long, you die. So how do you defend yourself from the horror? Well, you need to believe that there is something good, and you can figure things out, and you can be saved, but you can't actually go looking for things. Because the moment you go looking for them, you remind yourself, or you learn if you haven't before, that those things don't exist. And that starts you down the path of, wow, I should die right now. And I think the best way to shield yourself from truth is to find a concept or a sensation that makes you feel good and then train yourself not to think too hard about it. And then once that bubble pops, find the next distraction, find the next gooning, find the next political movement, or comforting belief or self-image and stay on it. Don't think about the horror. And what is reality for us then? Because clearly we haven't dropped it. Not entirely anyway. Well, if we think about it not as the all-encompassing mind-irradiating horror it is, and more as a tool, I think we could think of it as an addictive stimulant. Because reality does up your capabilities when you accept or try to accept reality. And I want to make a video about reality lessons, because we have learned a few interfacing with this thing that's going to kill us. And actually, let's take a moment to read them out in case I never make that video. I am want not to make videos when I say I'm going to make videos. So number one, you don't need to be quotes on 24-7 to access your abilities when needed. 
that's one of the things we've learned recently is even when you are trying to be happy go happy person if you've acquired it's like natural strength if you have acquired some of these reality abilities they will come out on your behalf even if you're trying to be mr happy too you can learn to enjoy others anger you can learn to enjoy the fact you're able to upset someone that much number three there are no good outcomes don't let the wrong fears keep you from taking the right actions. Do I need to explain these? So, for number two, you can learn to enjoy others' anger. You know the uncomfortable, painful, self-destructive, self-imploding hatred other people can inspire in you, and how awful that feels. You can do that to other people. And you can learn to like it. For number three, there are no good outcomes. Don't let the wrong fears keep you from taking the right actions. It's not going to end well no matter what you do. Anything you do is going to end in the worst way imaginable. Ergo, don't let fear of avoiding or, or stepping into a bad outcome stop you from taking an action you want to take or think you should take. Because it's not going to end well either way. Number four... Accept your worst aspects as traits that individualize you, not in spite of being bad, but because of being bad. These aren't things you really fight. You make a show of fighting them, but never put them under because you need them to be unique. Nothing is ever over. In other words, that part of yourself you hate or you're uncomfortable with or that hurts you or that you make a big show of fighting, even though you never actually do anything about it, Stop being a phony and accept something you already know. You need these negative traits to individualize you. If you suddenly lost all of your harmful traits, your ego would break down. You need something to feel victimized by. You need something to make a heroic show of fighting. You're probably better off accepting what it is for what it is. Number five, don't squirm. That is a general one, but one that is important everywhere. Number six, disable empathy selectively. You need to be able to do unjustifiable things. Things that are wrong in the eyes of man, in the eyes of God, and in your eyes. You need to be able to disable the part of yourself that stops you from doing things for moral reasons. And once achieved, all these lessons or abilities are going to stay with you. Reality, the more you embrace it and understand it, turns you into a terror. The problem is it kills you. If you still believe being Mr. or Miss Reality, Mr. or Miss Truth, at all costs, no matter how hard it hurts to look, I will not avert my eyes, and you aren't dead, then you're lying. Or you haven't climbed high enough on the ladder to fall lethally yet. More likely, you have achieved what people should aspire to achieve. Hiding from reality by fooling yourself into believing you are embracing it. You have worked yourself into a place. You will not go looking for the thing that will kill you because you believe you have found it and beaten it. You need something that will make you feel good and keep you occupied, distracted enough, you won't go wandering into the dark woods. We talked earlier about the potential bots or hidden algorithm is politics political division a playset designed to keep people occupied and away from thoughts that will destroy them and others and if it is is this something planned or is this something humanity as a species as a super organism is doing to protect itself? Is humanity using strife to shield itself from the horrors of reality 
the way we are doing right now on an individual level. It is some as above, so below shit. But unfortunately, we are on wizard vacation, so we can't get too deep into that. Now let's bitch about our occupation for the moment. But we'll start it with something positive. I love careers. Because by performing a career long enough, even the most useless, stupidest sack of shit can develop a set of skills to be valuable. You just do something and get money until you realize you are able to do it. Careers, jobs in which you are expected to perform higher order functions, are a lot of fun. Someone organizing an event in one of our subcommittees said, I'll handle all this. You don't need to worry about anything. In fact, I would prefer you not be involved. I want to handle everything and surprise everybody. Okay, I'll trust you. And then two days before the event, she leaves and hasn't done any of the things she said she was going to do. So I have to step in and not put out the fires because at this point, we don't have enough time or resources to put out the fires, but try to get them down to a comfortable level. More like fun around the bonfire and not burning alive. And I have to deal with a team I'm not used to, who wasn't communicating with this woman who was supposed to be organizing them because nobody knows what the fuck is going on. And I'm realizing they're going to try to pin the blame on me. As in they have this one dickhead I've never dealt with who comes in and it's, it feels like his job description is be a pain in the ass. Point out everything that's wrong, do nothing to make anything right. Now, it ended up turning out okay, and people pulled through in ways I thought they wouldn't be able to. And for all the additional hours they sprung on me, I have taken a couple days off, and it's very nice. And what I'm doing right now is a corporate skill called warm babbling. Breaking down what happened in this assignment was, or should be, a full video. But I initiated talking about it right here, but I didn't want to get into anything, so I am generalizing everything, speaking in very general terms, and trying to tell the truth while sounding positive, and also without giving out any specifics. Essentially, you are performing noise out of your mouth intended to take up time and possibly make someone happy. That's what corporate babbling is. And fuck that story, we're not talking about work right now. So while the event prep is going on, and while the event is going on, and I'm staying later and working weird hours, I'm coming home every day and I'm reading the Call of the Night manga. Or, no, it's Song of the Nightwalkers, I think. Which, while Call of the Night sounds better, it kind of rings better, Nightwalk is a harpoon in the heart. The story is a harpoon in the heart. But Nightwalks, they're, they're so... I love I loved the premise because it starts with just night walking. And when I was in my first semester of college, I night walked rather often until I got chased by a homeless guy while I was dumpster diving. But I loved the premise. I loved everything about it. I wanted an aesthetic vampire romance to melt my brain to. Because, you know, I don't want to know anything anymore. I think... Part of the reason I don't get close with people, in addition to the fact that they aren't beings, entities, to become close with, is the feeling of people moving on from you. People will lure you into making them part of your normal. And then they leave like it's nothing. And that makes you wonder a few things. Is connection something you hold 
too intensely? Do you care too much about your connection with another person? You've been overvaluing other people. Should you stop? Should you treat connections with other people as a lower order thing? Or is connection something that should be valued extremely highly? But if it is, then why does nobody treat it that way? The ending ending of Call of the Night didn't bother me that much. In fact, I like the author because Call of the Night reminds me a lot of Dune. It fucks up so many things, and it doesn't matter, it's still a classic. Call of the Night, the way Dune did, reminds me perfect writing doesn't need to be perfect. Like the stalker guitar videos. Those are perfect. Do you think they would be more perfect if the guitar were tuned, the fire were put out because it's too noisy, and the stalker knew exactly how to play guitar perfectly, had classical training or some shit? No. Perfection... Perfection is hitting a target, even if you d didn't know that that target was there, not necessarily how or why you hit the target. You have achieved something, and if you assume something is a fault, then consider that you wouldn't have hit it if that fault were not a fault. Anyway, while I didn't get my brain-melting happy ending, my brain-rot happy ending, I respect that the author has the balls to end in a way that people probably aren't going to be happy with. Because I think the ending does fit. But damn. But the ending didn't hurt me as much as everybody leaving to go do their own things did. And I know in the longer term, for a lot of those characters, that leaving isn't permanent. But just that moment of being left all alone is devastating. I think part of the reason I have moved toward not getting close with people is missing someone hurts and not letting people get close enough you would miss them if they were gone is easier than letting them get that close and then having to miss them for however long. I also liked Ko as a main character. Two things I like about him. And in part, the whole story. Ko and the story, or the story and Ko, don't make it easy to classify them. There are multiple points in the story characters do things for reasons that are stupid. You know, like people do. Certain events imbalance people's foundations, and then they take actions based on that reasoning, and it doesn't make sense, it's not supposed to make sense, and that is sometimes acknowledged. Typically in manga or anime, and in stories generally, people either act totally rationally all the time, or they do something really dumb that makes no sense and we're expected just to go with it like it does make sense? Anyway, characters in this series are beyond flawed, and not in the black and white, gray morality sort of way, but in the chain of events way. Flawed chains of events, or a series of unfortunate events way. To the point, Ko, the main character, he makes sense to his own logic and values, and not necessarily to anybody else's, with no sugarcoating. It's not even the outcome, or the actions the main character and the other characters choose, but more that their, their decisions are so specific to their characters, you cannot pigeonhole them. You can try, but it won't work. These characters are too individuated to get filed away and dismissed. Yet, 
they feel so familiar and comfortable. You know someone or you know a character like this character, but you don't know this person. And they aren't static. I think one of the things Dune does well, and really any story that sticks, is... So everyone talks about flat and round characters, you're familiar with this concept, it's elementary school bullshit. But you can write a character who develops, a character with character development, and not feel anything. Because they've developed in ways that don't strike empathy pressure points. In the same way, you can write a character who develops only a little bit, but if you hit those pressure points, it works. You feel it. It sticks. With Ko, you watch a kind character develop a less than kind side. With Nazna, you watch a character who, it's not just irresponsibility, it is apathy. You watch an apathetic, drifting character develop responsibility. And I think what else makes character development stick? is getting to see characters be their developed or developing selves. They don't just go through a change internally and then they make one decision that demonstrates that they have changed. That's bullshit, awful writing character development 101. Watching the framework by which characters make decisions change piece by piece is what feels good. That moment of, I could not see the you from five years ago doing something like this. Watching characters be human makes me hope humans can be human and I can be a human with them. I also haven't been creeped out by a manga since I read or started reading, I know it's gone further now, Monkey Peak back in 2019, I think? You learn Kiku is a La Sombra or Samisi fourth generation, it, not antediluvian, just a little bit weaker than that, tier vampire. You learn that she is one of these hyper threats, and then she just shows up outside Miss Detective's office. It's like Michael Myers. She's just standing there, menacingly. And it, well, not standing there, but hiding behind a door. But it managed to creep me out in a way a manga hasn't in some time. But even she you can't paint into a corner. They make it like human nature or desire is a cosmic horror something beyond your comprehension. Something as basic as a human being is impossible to make sense of. And then I find out the author wrote Dagashi Kashi, and I didn't read the manga for that. I watched, I think, the first season of the anime, and I bounced off it because it felt so generic. I mean, interesting concept, but I don't care about any of these characters. And then this, Call of the Night or Song of the Nightwalkers, this is Chainsaw Man realm. This is... I'm not going to put it on the same, in the same tier as Chainsaw Man, because Chainsaw Man, Chainsaw, Chainsaw Man did what it did with zero fuck-ups. I don't think I've ever read a tighter manga. It's, it's insane that something like that exists. But Call of the Night achieves the same feeling. And I think that's one of the re that we talked about it earlier, but that something as flawed as called Call of the Night, I'm, I'm stumbling over my words today, can hit as hard as something like Chainsaw Man while fucking everything up in the process. It's terrific. It hit me on an emotional level and I didn't want it to end. And I normally don't like spin-offs, but with this one, I hope we get something. 
Because it's not just, I'm interested in this world and these characters and I want more of them. That's true, but I think this vibe, this universe, this atmosphere, I think this author could do a lot more, or do more human soul stuff with it. And while we are babbling and recommending things, new shooter on Steam. It's called Vladic Brutal. V-L-A-D-I-K-B-R-U-T-A-L. It's incredible in the sewers it starts in, but once you get out of the sewers, it's pretty mind-blowing. You know we love independence, solo anybody's on here. This comes from a solo developer. It is a $10 really tight first-person shooter. In fact, I've been thinking about making a video about it once I'm done with it, and I think I will, because it's, it's so good. But, again, $10, solo developer, Vladic, brutal. I can't recommend it enough. Mainly because of how the basic shooting feels. All the guns sound really good. They feel really good. And there aren't hit markers, but there's a lot of sound and gore and splash effects, almost like blood, not blood, but like the game blood effects. So you have all this feedback so you know when you're hitting without a bunch of distracting stuff. It's minimalist. It's great. Really good. But I think we'll cut it all here. We'll try to find a thread to grab and follow for subsequent videos. Like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you haven't. So what do you do when YouTube puts you in upload prison? Like Limbo, your processing won't get approved or denied. Well, you mess with some things to try to figure out exactly what's happening. And in our case, for good measure, we just stick another video on the end. The forward assist of upload strategies. You know, it might not be the political stuff. It might actually be analytics discussions. You ever notice the way YouTubers... You almost never see YouTubers discuss at length their analytics and how they use them. Well, that could be a choice, but on that last video, one of the things... I wrote a comment responding to somebody explaining what's going on, and I got into analytics stuff. And that comment got shadow blocked. It got limboed too. And it happened in a weird way. Typically, when YouTube hides something, you can see that something is there, but you aren't allowed to access it. You aren't allowed to read it. When this happened, I could read it perfectly fine, but it said, or the system acted as, as if it didn't exist. It's weird. So maybe I'll need... If this version doesn't work, maybe I'll need to cut out all the analytics talk. Now, this has happened before, and there's a pattern to it, but it has never persisted like this. Typically, when we make a video that pisses a bunch of people off, reports come in with that. Now, we are very careful to abide by terms of service, and I still believe there is a positive faction in YouTube trying to make things better. That's why YouTube is a little bit more lenient than other platforms are, even though it might not seem like it because people play it super safe. You can say things like suicide, for instance. You can use slurs if you want to. Now, if you're going to do those things, you need to accommodate advertisers, essentially, and that usually means a pay cut. So if you see a YouTuber using baby talk, it could be just playing it safe. I mean, we still use baby talk because I don't know if or when this leniency or this positive faction is going to go under. Gotta play it safe. But if you aren't playing it safe, it is a financial decision. I'll admit, as disregarding what our content is or how it comes across, 
I take pride in our low spiciness level. This all to say, even when we do get floods of reports, there is not much to get us on. But there must be some kind of mechanism there, because in the days following these pissing people off videos, we get briefly limboed, and that can last from anywhere between an hour to a day, but never longer than that. Here, it's been happening for a few days, and none of the typical tricks have fixed it. That's partially why I made that Vladic review video. I did want to talk about it, but I also wanted to experiment with this limbo system, because we've never experimented with it before. We've never needed to. Ergo, something weirder is going on. I don't know if it is the political spiciness, which again, weird. You can be spicy in other ways, including politically, and we often are, and there are no issues. Aside from filling you in and reworking this video in a larger way, none of this matters. Let's talk about some other things while we're here. I'm trying to figure out what to do without the reality pursuit. It reminds me of Call of the Night. I don't want to hate everything, but I do hate everything because everything is just so gosh darn hateable. So even when you are trying for your health to be positive, or just to think nothing, all it takes is a little bit of nastiness. Not even nastiness you are associated with, just nastiness in the air. Just a little bit gets that ball rolling. There is this feeling of aimlessness and helplessness when you are trying not to die. And how do you overcome that? Well, I am experimenting with building your fantasy. You can't beat reality, but you can construct for yourself a happy bunker. Sets of sensations, values, dreams, things that work on smaller levels that you can distract yourself with in a structured way. These are totally doable reaches that, if you don't think about them too hard, make you feel good to think about and might make you feel good if you achieve them. And I'm thinking if you focus on these things hard enough and long enough, you might be able to fool yourself into a pocket reality in which you can be mostly happy. You'll never not be aware of reality, but maybe with enough work and time, you can distance yourself from it. And lately, I've been feeling something between nothing and sad, which is distinct from the pressure, the dark drum, the tolling bells, the nausea, and so on. I actually haven't felt particularly nauseous recently. It comes and goes, but it's not a constant thing. But I don't like feeling sad, and I don't know how to feel nothing. I'll get to these places I'm not thinking about anything, I'm not feeling anything, and I don't know what to do when I'm in that space. Nothing, in terms of emotions, feels okay. At least it doesn't hurt. But, there's also nothing happening. And if we are going to be something, if we are going to exist as a something, then I want something. Must you think and do nothing to maintain an okay emotional state? No, but you need to delude yourself at a high level. Delude yourself so much you have forgotten that you are deluding yourself and build delusion defenses. Things that protect you from other people's reality without needing to rip your ribs open and spew forth the tentacles of your own reality. And on that note, I've been thinking about love again. You have an idea of yourself. You have an experience of knowing yourself. Even if you don't, quotes, know yourself totally, 
you know what it feels like to know you. Would you want to know yourself the way other people know you? Would you want to feel someone else's experience of knowing you? One part of me says yes. I want to know as much of reality as possible. Another part of me says, no, that's going to lead to your dying. And the other part of me just wonders about people's feelings. Somewhere earlier in this video, we discussed feelings of abandonment. Part of the reasons I bail on relationships is I don't want to be left. If there has to be a separation, I want to be the one ripping off the band-aid. And in the way we normally think, there will be a separation. Because it seems like for connections to work, you can't be or pursue reality at all times. You need to trick yourself into and then through loving someone. Because if you don't, you are going to be too perceptive to threats. And you have to fool yourself because you should be perceptive of threats. People want to destroy you. Even if they don't think they want to, they will at some point. Or under some set of conditions. Many of which you have no control over. Meaning, to love someone, you need to trick yourself into misstepping you need to make bad decisions. Decisions you learned are bad because you made them and then learned not to make them again. Even though you trick yourself into making them again and then get that same bad outcome, cycles of reinforcing things you already know. You need to throw all that shit away. But then you think about snubbing relationships early or not allowing them to come up in the first place. What do you think someone feels when they love you? Disregard everything else. That feeling. If you could feel someone else's love for you, for yourself, would that feeling, if it's true, if it's true love, would the purity of that feeling be enough to risk disregarding all that other shit we just disregarded. Because in your shoes, from your perspective, it is easy to say, you have your feelings, sure, but these other factors are wrong, they're setting us up for failure, and we can't do anything about them, or I'm not going to do anything about them, or you aren't going to do anything about them. And then on top of that, Despite your feelings, you have done these number of things that indicate on a different level you don't feel your love as intensely as you feel you feel it and just haven't realized it yet. So we're done. Before it gets ugly. Because it will, and it already has a little bit. Right now we're getting a taste of what's going to happen. And all that can be true, but is someone's love, even with all those things that are true, pure enough or real enough it is worth taking that risk, even if you know it isn't going to end well? I think that is the next stage. You can't feel what someone else feels, but against your tried judgment, you can learn to trust someone, or try to trust them when they tell you they love you. Trust that they mean it. Once again, in spite of everything that's wrong and everything bad that is going to happen. I think you can learn to trust someone enough to feel that purity and take a risk. Or inflict the damage now because that purity is worth taking that damage for. Cut your finger off. And we're talking about all this because one of my potential happy bunkers is a family. I'm conflicted about having children, but I still want them. 
Meaning, even if children never happen, I want the plan, TM, to accommodate for them if we make that decision. And I also don't want my children in daycare. I want to be able to raise them the way I wanted to be raised. So if I have children, they don't turn out like I did. That means either one of the parents doesn't work, or at least one works from home, preferably both, or, or you turn your house into an actual asset. I was reading a bit about how a bed and breakfast works, and with the correct amount of financial bullshittery, that's a reach, but it's doable. I'll find money. Right now, I am in the vegan CEO cocoon. I saw a job posting that would double my salary right now that I am overqualified for. That's a job I know I could get. With the limited skills I have, and as time goes on, I'll only gather skills. And there are so many ways out there to make money when you don't want to die and you have something to believe in, something worth working for. So a bed and breakfast with work from home stuff, maybe just part-time work from home, in addition to, I'm beginning to hate, well no, we have hustle grinding, that's our word. Other hustle grinding shit Plus the bed and breakfast money, that's that's a financially goodable thing. And in that situation, with teamwork with your partner, you could essentially raise your children yourself. And uh, without really sacrificing anything. And another thing I'm realizing, I am very skittish about admitting that I like love. As if just admitting that is going to weaken me. I think what I despise more than anything is another person having power over me in my own soul. Someone could torture you to death physically and you would still have or at least be you inside. Love is fucked up because it does what torture can't. Getting control of your soul in a way you want to happen. The throne of your soul you are made to want to give away. How do you enjoy a feeling that you are more terrified of than anything? I don't know, but I think we've rambled enough. And, fortunately, all this rambling is at the very back of the scuffedest video we have produced. So it's safe and obscure. And now we figure out what we need to do to get this video out of limbo. Like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you haven't.